Today we are going to talk about big data and data science. These four words which will sell everything today. But again, I will explain why we will talk about this and how they are basically connected together. I am a CTO of a quantum company. My name is Alex. Uh, so a few words about the company. Maybe not about the company, but about the data science department. We opened the data science department three years ago. And after these three years, we managed to complete uh, dozens of projects, because in data science projects are not always big, so they are maybe small. And throughout these years, we've seen some trends emerge, and about the trends we want to talk about today. Um, I will describe uh, a bit uh, which trends we see in data science area nowadays. And then present you two use cases which actually adhere to these trends and show exactly why I think these trends are happening. First use case will be about the epilepsy. Uh, but uh, at first I want to talk about the big data. So big data may be a bit misleading. So if I ask somebody what is big data, if uh, I don't know one gigabyte is big enough or one terabyte is big enough, then they said, okay, one terabyte is probably not a big data. Again, two terabytes is big data or not. So what basically is big data? Uh, and the answer to this question is that uh, big enough for what? So people think that big data is big enough to make it troublesome to process this data. So I want to give a bit a different meaning to the big data in this talk. Is that big data is big enough to make some end-to-end -end models work. But uh, usually these two are come together, so when you have uh, big data enough to make some model work, you usually have troubles to process this data because it's too big to process. So anyways, um, here is a trend we see that uh, different projects we take part in are on one of the three stages. So the first stage is when you have simple rules. So for instance, you have a factory, you have some machinery in there, and uh, you have a simple rule, okay, if the temperature of this machine uh, during the five last minutes, uh, minutes is bigger than 50 degrees, so then you should turn it off. So that's a simple rule that works throughout the world right now. So, but then they started to move to the feature-based models, is when experts start to think, okay, maybe we should uh, make logic be more, more agile, so they introduce some rules. Uh, they introduce some features, so they take temperature during the last five minutes, they take vibrations during the last I don't know, half an hour. If you, uh, how many times you hear some strange sound from this machinery, you put this as another feature and then you make some classifier. Okay, it's this classifier that says, uh, should I turn the mission off or everything is okay. Um, but when you collect a lot of data, uh, you probably do not need to collect these features anymore. So you do not need this expert who will think, okay, what is important to make this decision? And you start to feed the data you have into some model, which decide what is important and what is not. And uh, during the last five, 10 years, in many areas, we collected enough data to move to the third stage. And the first such area is uh, medicine. Uh, where we took part in the project, this was a half year uh, long project where we classified epilepsy patients. So a bit background of the subject. Um, there are two kinds of uh, patients uh, with epilepsy. One of them are drug resistant and the other are not drug resistant. What means they are drug resistant? Is that uh, if they take some pill, it doesn't help. It has some short term effects, but uh, after a while, they still experience the seizures and they need to switch to another drug. So for other people, which is a majority, maybe 90% of them are non-drug resistant, they just need to increase the dosage over time, but they feel okay with one kind of pills throughout their lives. Um, and the other input I want to give about epilepsy is that nowadays we do not know a lot about this disease. So the only thing we do is to uh, minimize the seizures, but we don't understand the mechanisms that uh, is happening behind this, why we, why we have the seizures. So our task was to improve the classification between these uh, patients. And why this is important is that patients that are drug resistant, they need a special treatment. They do not need to switch pills over time. They need sometimes even surgery. 
to, to, to make them live uh, fine. And uh, nowadays, in order to be uh, diagnosed as a drug resistant, you need to spend three years in a hospital taking some pills that don't help you. And we uh, try to minimize this time. So we try to classify a patient as a drug resistant after one year or maybe two years and not make uh, him suffer for three years. So uh, what we have as an input? Uh, there is a uh, group of data scientists working with a farm company who uh, were trying to make this classification. And they uh, engineered 3,000 features. So what kind of features? These features like uh, whether uh, the patient took pills uh, last three, uh, 30 days uh, or whether patient had uh, seizures last 90 days or what is the dosage of this pill during uh, throughout the year, something like this. So 3,000 such features uh, which they think uh, may help us classify the patient to be either drug resistant or not drug resistant. Mm. And uh, they worked on this uh, throughout many years and throughout these years uh, uh, it was possible to collect the data about patients. So it, it's a bit uh, difficult to collect the data because uh, this is not standardized throughout uh, clinics. And for instance, if you come to Germany, you do not have such data at all. In USA, this is possible to collect such data, but from insurance. So we had claims data for 450,000 patients. So that's quite a lot of uh, patients. That basically means uh, almost everybody who has insurance in US. That means almost everybody in US. And uh, this claims data basically contains information about uh, diagnosis, procedures, and drugs prescribed. That's what insurance pays for. So uh, what we did first is that we took uh, 55 uh, top features. So this scientist uh, built the model, simple model, just for logistic relations. They, uh, they switched to XGBoost and produced a model that worked fine. But our task was to improve this model. So first of all, we built a baseline model with XGBoost and uh, used the top 55 features they provided. And we were able um, to make the same result as they did. So that was like rock hook uh, 0 0.77. So I believe you know what is this rock hook because you are like data scientists. OK, so that's basically the quality of the model, some trade-off between precision and recall. So, but anyways, uh, we just took 55 features, and uh, so I'm talking about the left side of this diagram. Just took 55 features and fit it into the boost address and got this, this result. So that's the baseline. Then we thought, okay, what we can do if we just uh, add some information from their treatment history. So what we did is that we took uh, treatment history for patients and uh, encoded this information. How we encoded it? So uh, treatment history consists of some codes. Uh, these are standardized codes, but we didn't want to encode them like um, bag of words, uh, one hot encode. Uh, we wanted to give them evidence. So we used the claimed history as a sentences and used the same schema model to give them evidence. So basically drugs or diagnosis or procedures uh, prescribed to the patient is the same context uh, would uh, obtain the close evidence. So in this way, we created evidence for these uh, ICD codes, which represent diagnosis and um, procedures, and for drugs. So drugs, they have their own codes. And then we just did uh, like global pooling on them and obtained uh, 200 more features, which we feed into the same decision tree. And what we get is that uh, Rogo increase in 2%. So what does this mean? Is that uh, means that uh, scientists, despite they worked many years on this topic, they missed some information that contains in the claims history. So they didn't catch with 3,000 features what's in there. They just were not able to do this because it's like it was too complex. Um, and that gave, it, uh, gave us a clue that this uh, claims history contains some information that might help to improve this classification. And what is to person? Actually, to person is that on the 450,000 people, like 10,000 people. So then we move to a bit more uh, elaborate models uh, in order to improve the quality of the model. So what we did basically is that we created a deep learning model where we used uh, embeddings and swim 
So I will not dive deeply into the swag model. And the final model level was a bit more complex than this one, but still uh, what you need to figure out from this diagram is that there was a deep learning model. And we, we fed this 55 features we had already. And we created the deep learning model that produces more features and uh, pushed it into the fully connected classifier. We need to have fully connected classifier to make it uh, train all together. And then what we, what we obtained is that we increased rock hook to 0.81, so which was like a state of the art in this field at the moment. But that's not so interesting. So the interesting experiment that the farm company asked us to perform was the third one. So the third one is the same as the second one, except that we get rid of 55 features from the experts. We uh, leave only age. So age is what you cannot find with, uh, in the claims history. Everything else you can find there, except some uh, information that they ask at us not to include in there, like gender and like zip codes, just because of privacy. And what's interesting about this model, uh, so maybe somebody can give a clue what's so interesting about this model. <laughs> okay, so the interesting thing about this model is that we do not use the information from experts. So you need to understand that we are not experts in the epilepsy disease. Of course we know some information about it because we worked half a year on this project, but still we are not like doctors. We don't understand at all the, the epilepsy. We know like a little bit more than everybody else. And we just created a model and fed everything we, ca uh, we had for five, 10 years for patients. And we obtained the Rocco 0.80. And if you compare this to Rocco, uh, which scientists obtained after several years of work, which was 0.77, you understand that this model was able to perform better. And that's not because we are so clever, that's because it just we had so much more data they had at that time. And this data couldn't be processed manually. And uh, that was like amazing result uh, because uh, yeah, because in half a year some batch from high school didn't know a thing about epilepsy could produce such result just because uh, industry produces this data. And that makes uh, they think how to standardize uh, the collection of this data because we were just lucky that insurance had this data. Clinics do not collect this data. Uh, in Europe you don't have the data at all. Uh, I don't know about Israel. But. So, and then we started to look into cases and analyze uh, in which cases patients are drug resistant. And we figured it out, uh, for instance, that uh, some patients which had uh, depression and took pills uh, from depression are likely to be drug resistant. So and this knowledge is something that wasn't known before. Uh, even for experts working in this field. We don't understand why uh, people uh, suffering from depression are drug resistant. So we are not doctors and even doctors do not understand why. But statistically uh, we have proven that okay, uh, there's some piece of information you may use now to better understand this disease. So that's valuable. And we figured out a bunch of su such information that we pass it to the experts. So, uh, before we move to the next case, maybe somebody has some questions regarding this one. Yes? Did you actually give the data to experts? And what experts say about uh, these new features extracted? They help them? So, we didn't extract new features. We just built the model. OK, let's look uh, a bit on this model. So, on the top, you see that we did, uh, we mix all information from the claims history and coded the evidence. So, what is claims history, basically? Here it is. So, for each patient, what we have is the information about the date, some code. The code may represent a procedure or a diagnosis, or the code may represent some drug. And, uh, actually, code type. And this information is mixed and then sent to the SVEM model. The SVEM model uh, it produces as an output just uh, 200 uh, size vector. But, but now the expert can better uh, predict uh, something about the patient with the disease? Yes, basically now uh, the expert can predict better, but it doesn't mean that he understands better why he is drug resistant. 
So these features that produced by SVM model are um, not interpretable. So it's not like if you have a feature whether patient uh, is uh, older than 55 years, it means something to you. If you have some feature in the out, after the same model, just a number, you don't understand what, what, what does it mean. I don't want to understand, I want to predict only, only to, to give better uh, solution to the patient. So it can be done. Okay. Yes, uh, it can be done. So at the moment, we are on the stage of the certification of the model. So in US, you need to certify a model to be able to use it. And the, this model is about to be uh, deployed to the Symfony. Symfony is the organization which actually collects the claims data. Uh, it has contracts with the insurance companies. And it sells this data to farm companies to make analysis. But if you want to provide something for doctors, so they can, uh, some therapists, physicians, you need to deploy this model to Symfony because the Symfony produces interfaces for clinics. So that's the kind of the stuff that happens in the US. But we met a bit, uh, a bit of a problem with certification of the model. Because in the US, uh, when you have, uh, in the US they have laws which prescribe you to interpret your results. For instance, when you want to, ha to have a loan, a uh, bank can, uh, uh, cannot give you a loan. But a, a bank must uh, describe you why. So, so he says, okay, your income is lower than this one. That's because you, you don't have a loan. And that's in the law. And here is the same stuff. So you need to say why you think patient is drug resistant. And the interpreti uh, interpretability of the, of the model, such uh, deployment model, is a bit of a um, uh, challenge. So that's another project, how to interpret the results. So if you have logistic regression, everything is simple. You have these uh, results already, yes? Yeah? Uh, if you think the patient is drug resistant, you say, okay, that's because he I don't know, he is a woman, he is older than this one, or he, he takes these pills uh, and they are not successful because of this, I think he is rough resistant. In this case, so you just fed all claims data in, in the model and it says, okay, it's drug resistant, but why? So nobody understands. So now uh, we are about to certify this model, but that's a big com uh, complex uh, stuff. And in order to do so, first of all, we need to solve the task of, of interpretability. So there are some frameworks that allow to do you, uh, such as in, such as Sniper, for instance, and you even can uh, use it on your uh, PyTorch and TensorFlow model. But in this case, we built uh, custom layers, and this don't, doesn't work out of the box. So we need to spend like three months more just to make something that can interpret, interpret results. And again, maybe we uh, may not solve this task at all. So it's not like just about the time. Um, and about the big data in this case, so as I, as I told you, we have uh, uh, claims history for 450,000 patients for 5-10 years. So you may imagine that's quite a bit, so for each patient we had like uh, ranging from 100 to multiple thousand of entries. And uh, to train such a model we spent two days and uh, that's not such a crucial number, but these two days were spent not exactly on training the model, but just on gathering the data from the Azure warehouse. So we needed to spend two days to uh, go through this, the data multiple times to, to train the model. So that's why it's uh, what was so slow in, in, in training, but it, it was quite, uh, not so heavy model in, in inference mode. One more question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, why did you use here the embedding uh, uh, procedure on the, it was on the names of the drugs, right? Of the treatments. Um, it was uh, not on the names of the drugs. So if you want to fit something into the model, you need to represent it as a, as a number. You can't represent it as a code. So, um, obvious. <coughs> yeah, you can do one foot encoded, but in this way you lose information. Um, it's the same way you lose information when you one hot encode words, because words may be synonyms, they may be used in the same context, and you want to represent this information in some way. One hot encoding loses this information entirely. So, here the problem was uh, about losing such an information, that's the, the first thing. Another thing, the space of this uh, vector would be really huge because we had too many uh, codes 
for the diagnosis and the procedures and too many calls for names for, for drugs. And in order to overcome this, um, we did. We assume that the codes have some uh, space that uh, the, the range of the codes or something are close to each other because there is no information in the code, right? It's, uh, yes, there is no information in the code itself. Um, but what we did is that uh, many patients have some uh, treatment history. So you may uh, take this treatment history as a sentence. Yeah? Uh, as you do this real sentence, then you can build uh, embeddings for words. So for words that are met in similar contexts, you will give the similar vectors. In this case, so imagine that patients had similar diseases, and for similar diseases, they were prescribed with similar diagnosis, procedures, and uh, drugs. So, but they may differ. So we see, okay, this patient has the same diagnosis as this one and the same procedure, but a bit different drugs. But maybe these drugs are similar in their effect. So in this way, we, create, we use the same Skibra model to represent uh, all these codes as, as a vectors by their context. So you describe the treatment as a sequence? So yes, we describe the treatment as a sequence. Um, so we take the treatment history for, for one of the patients, and then we encode each entry as a uh, 100 size vector. And then we, we fed this uh, list of vectors into the model. So this can be different models like LSTM. So we tried LSTM as well, but the problem with that was that it uh, didn't handle uh, long sequences, like multiple thousands. So it did lose it. What? Uh, after the embedding is built, we just have a list of vectors, and that's it. So you can fetch this list of vectors to every model that can receive the list of vectors. This can be RNN, this can be any other thing. So for the model, uh, there is a paper in the internet, you can find it. So this is called, uh, so the SVEM, uh, this is called the simple word embeddings model. There are three kinds of them, so we tried all of them. And the final model is a bit more complex, it's like um, stacking of multiple models multiple SVEM and one CNN. But still, that's not the point of, the, um, of this presentation. So the point wa uh, was that we were able to achieve better results than the experts. So you may uh, invent any other model. So, and the model is not so important, basically. So the importance here is the data. So you can copy the model, but you can do anything with it because you do not have access to the data. So the data is real value in, uh, in this case. Okay, so the next thing uh, that uh, is possible nowadays because we have data is uh, another project we made in the area uh, of architect. So that's about the deforestation. So deforestation when you cut the trees in insane amounts and then you don't have trees in, <laughs> in the amount you want. So despite Ukraine has lots of trees, so basically I am from Kharkiv, and Kharkiv was built uh, in the middle of the forest, so it was cut inside of it and then it just grew. And we have trees uh, a lot everywhere, so that's like uh, not a big deal for Kharkiv citizens, but still what we are fighting here is not uh, uh, with um, some insane tree cuts, uh, insane amount of tree cuts. What we are fighting here is with tree cuts in prohibited areas. And uh, before uh, information from Sentinel uh, was available publicly, it was not possible to do this at all. Because uh, what uh, people did previously is that uh, in every single village, in every single place, you need to go to a forest and see whether somebody cuts the trees there or not, uh, and uh, <coughs> prohibit this in some and enforce uh, these uh, limitations in some way. But nowadays, uh, we have Sentinel-2, which just flies multiple times per week around the world. And what they did is that they made this information public accessible. So it's not so, if you want a bit more quality and frequency, you need to pay for it. But if you just OK uh, with uh, one image per week, then that's fine. And if you fight with three cards, probably you don't need more frequent than one, one, one per week. So and the quality is like 10 meters, uh, one point is 10 meters uh, size. So this is quite enough to actually uh, find the uh, three cards. Okay, uh, 
So that's how data flows in this project. And the main po point of this diagram is not to make you read all this stuff. Is that uh, the main point of this diagram is that it's not like you just take a picture from Sentinel, apply a model, and produce a result. So when you deal with uh, imagery from Sentinel, that's again uh, quite amount of data. And uh, you need to process this in the ground. You need to apply a model in the ground. You need to catch these results in some database that allows you to search by some shape. So for instance, in this field, uh, what pictures do I have? So for instance, here we use PostBees for this. And uh, yeah, th that's one of the examples where the amount of data makes it tricky to process it. And you need to do uh, something about it. Some layers of cache and stuff like this. Okay, so and Sentinels provides you with a uh, bunch of channels that you may use to uh, analyze whether you have triggers or uh, you have like a healthy prison there. So that's like RGB, so the near infrared and NDVI. So it provides not NDVI, it provides uh, like uh, infrared and red, and you can calculate NDVI, but that's not important. As well, uh, in Kharkiv, we have a lot of universities that produce a lot of students that you may use to label data. And <laughs> use a bunch of data scientists to make a model, label it by students. Yeah, we cooperate with a lot of uh, universities in the city. Not just for this purpose, of course. So yeah, then we use a, uh, not a simple UNET, so here is just a picture of UNET, uh, but a bit uh, modified version of it. Uh, and uh, this was enough to produce information about the tree cards. So here you can see a picture where, uh, with the red areas, we uh, show uh, fields where there were trees, and now there are, there are no trees. And then this information is sent to the authority that has, uh, I don't know how this, to translate in English, but they have a list of areas which are prohibited to where you cannot make it regards. And now they can actually go there and see by themselves what's happening in there. So this was one of the examples that was not possible before. And uh, one of the examples uh, where nowadays you, you have a data that you can use to provide something uh, that's not just automates the human work, but that's increase it, uh, the value and uh, makes it possible was not possible before. So other stuff uh, that is now available in Agritech are drones, of course, uh, satellites, some machinery. Every machinery has uh, sensors in it. So for instance, if you use John Deere, you can, there is a service that has contact with John Deere in, and you may upload the file from the combine, for instance, and they parse it and provide you information where it was, what it did, so you can analyze this. That's not for free, but still it's like manageable. And of course, uh, you may use some sensors in the field. Uh, that's uh, really actual for some greenhouses where you don't have drones or satellite images. And uh, now what we see is that uh, after five, 10 years, the amount of data co uh, collected in the agritech is enough to provide some end-to-end -end models, which will increase the possibilities of the, uh, what agriculture can, can do nowadays. For instance, you may even uh, increase precision and work with, with each tree. So for instance, uh, nowadays it's not possible manually to go to and to see how each tree is growing. But uh, nowadays it's possible to see whether some tree needs irrigation or whether uh, some tree uh, need some special treatment or have a disease. So you can work on the tree instance level just because of the drones. So sat satellites, of course, do not uh, allow you to do the satellite just as 10 meters uh, precision. So and even you can use sensors which you put on the uh, leaves to analyze its temperature. So satellite can provide such information drone as well. So, uh, you may wonder what is common between these cases. So, of course, uh, such cases, as I uh, told before, share the problems or tasks how to build data pipelines. Uh, because in both of these projects, it was tricky how to process such amounts of data. And when you try to build end-to-end -end model, you always, well, not always, but almost always, 
have such a problem uh, how to deal with a big amount of data and you do not uh, and you ha need to have a data engineer in your team to, to do this. Uh, so data scientists are good when they provide some model, but in order to productize this, you need a data engineer that will build the data pipeline. So another stuff is data privacy. It's not so uh, relevant to the agri-tech, but in medicine is a really hot topic. Um, uh, as I said, we even needed to remove zip code from the model, for instance, just because that's uh, not that's against HIPAA, and uh, a lot of stuff, some st uh, such stuff will arise in the future when people will see what they expose, actually. And I, I believe in architect will hit the same problem uh, eventually. So uh, the third task is the results in repeatability. Uh, even in agritech, when you say, okay, this tree need uh, have some disease and need some treatment, you need to provide why you see so. So for some cases that's obvious, for some cases that's not. So you've seen that, for instance, uh, NDVI level is lower, so you need to report to the, uh, to the man who is respon responsible for this area that, okay, so you need to irrigate just because of it, uh, and not just say, okay, irrigate it. So because models as well, uh, they have some uh, amortization, and maybe nowadays it works fine, and in half a year it will just make these people irrigate everything just because data is not relevant anymore. And as well, model certifications. So, okay, uh, in the healthcare, that's really sensitive. And uh, it's really new. For instance, in the US, uh, they come up with such, uh, came up with such uh, low just about, uh, I believe, nine months ago. So that's really new. And I believe, uh, in every area where we will we will implement and turn models, we will come up eventually to the point where uh, authorities will introduce some laws how to certify what you are doing, because otherwise it will just like uh, um, models that produce some results uh, which you may believe or may not believe, but that may influence somebody's lives, and you need to regulate this in some way. So. That's a common task, but the common trend uh, which we see is that uh, nowadays more and more areas uh, collect the data which is enough to build into models. And we see this in medicine, and I believe in Europe they will collect the data as well eventually. And we see this in other tech nowadays, so we see more and more projects in this area. And this will be commodity in other areas. And the role of experts in this uh, case will be not more to generate these features. This will more to analyze the results of these models. So uh, as well as healthcare, we pro provide results. Uh, and at this point, uh, we try to certify this model so it's not in production, but experts use this to better understand the disease. So they like use this model for their own needs, but they don't make this model anymore. Okay, that's it. Questions, wisdoms. <laughs> I don't even understand. When you say certification of a model, you need a certificate to use the model, or they give you a certificate to allow users your model. Okay. Um, and uh, that's specific right now to the U.S. healthcare. And if you implement the deployment model, you need to certify it in order to use it and to recommend something, uh, something to the physicians. And at the moment, uh, there were two cases of the models that uh, we were dealing with the uh, imagery that, that were certified because the law is raised in you. And this model doesn't deal with imagery, it deals with the data analytics. And uh, there were no models uh, dealing with data analytics certified in the US at this point. So we like trying to make a, a new road there. There are different... Um, other cases. So, for instance, you may make a recommendation system which will uh, say, for instance, okay, uh, I think this patient is drug resistant, pay attention to these features. For such model, you do not need the certification because you just recommend. Uh, so, when physician says, okay, maybe this patient is drug resistant, uh, models suggest me he is, what should I pay attention to? That's, you do not need to certify. But 
in this case, you need to interpret the results of the model. You need to point to the physician why you think he is uh, drug resistant. And there are other cases, for instance, when you, so there were some proof of concept for a project where uh, people provide analysis to, the, to a doctor which uh, need to say, okay, this patient has this type of cancer. And they, they, uh, then they need to take a biopsy. Biopsy is something you take without um, anesthetic, so it's like painful. And if you miss, so you don't get the kind of cancer, you need to do another biopsy, so that's painful. So in this case, we provided for this. Uh, so the main uh, requirement in this case was model interpretability. So we needed not just say, okay, we think it's this type of cancer. We just needed to say, we think this is this type of cancer, pay attention to these uh, results of the analysis. So the physician, if this uh, result was not what he anticipated, he just check it one more time what model suggested to check, and that's it. In this case, you do not need to certify a model because it doesn't make a decision. It just suggests to do a second like check on the patient and that's it. Um, so yes, so there are different cases where you do not need to do a certification, but still uh, for the models where you cannot right now interpret, that, interpret results and you really suggest something for the physician, this must be certified. I hope this answers the question. Okay, I think that's it. Um, thanks for attention. So here you can find some contacts. Um, so yeah, so if you have some additional questions, I know you may find me here around, I believe next 30 minutes or so. Okay, thanks for attention.